Well, last week we looked at Jesus being led into the desert by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. And today in this second Sunday of Lent, we look at Jesus being gloriously transformed. And each week we get closer and closer to Calvary, but the transfiguration is one of the most important events in the public life of Jesus. It's also one of the luminous mysteries of the rosary given to us by St. John Paul II in 2002. Now there are, there are now 20 rosary mysteries, and this one is one of my absolute favorites because there's so much in it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each report on the transfiguration. And in Matthew's account, Jesus' appearance becomes radically changed. And Peter, James, and John all have the opportunity <clears throat> to look on Jesus' divine glory. He's showing them that not only is he fully human, but he's also a divine person. He is the glorious son of the father. And that's something that the father himself confirms. And that's a huge part of the transfiguration story. And while all of them are there on the mountaintop, they encounter both Moses and Elijah. Now, why would that be? Well, Moses was the great lawgiver for the Jews, the one who led the Israelites out of Egypt and eventually to the promised land after 40 years in the desert. It was in the desert where Moses not only personally encountered God on a mountaintop himself, but he was given the law for the people to live, the same law that the people of Jesus's time had been following ever since. Jesus came to fulfill that law and make it into something life-giving. Now, there are quite a few similarities between Jesus and Moses, but Jesus is shown today in our gospel reading as greater than Moses because he's being revealed as the divine son of God. And we hear a voice in the cloud, in the cloud coming from the cloud, Confirming that, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet, represents all the Old Testament prophets who predicted and foretold the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ himself. In the Old Testament, Elijah too had an encounter with God on the same mountaintop as Moses centuries earlier. And so these two figures, Moses and Elijah, each of whom encountered God on the top of the mountain in the Old Testament, are both now there on top of another mountain, together with Jesus for this revelation of God for the New Testament as well. But this account of Jesus's transfiguration is actually more than a revelation that Jesus is the son of the divine father, as well as the fact that Jesus himself is a divine person. In fact, our gospel story is actually another revelation of the mystery of the most holy trinity. Maybe you recall earlier this year, we heard Matthew's account of the baptism of the Lord, where all three persons of the trinity show up. And it happens again here as well. The father speaks in the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son. And the son is revealed through the transformation of his faith, of his face and clothing on that mountain where his divine glory is revealed. But the Holy Spirit is also there and in the form of the, of the cloud that covered them all. Now the spirit <clears throat> was always depicted through images of cloud and fire in the Old Testament. And the Israelites followed that cloud, which appeared in the shape of a pillar by day, and it became at night a pillar of fire. So all three persons we saw at Jesus' baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who appeared at his baptism as a dove, we see again here at the transfiguration, Father, Son, and the cloud of the Spirit. Really, those three apostles were given a huge privilege. They've been brought into the experience of the revelation of the Trinity, and that's why Peter notes that it is good that they are there. 
And he implies that he just wants to stay there to camp out. He wants to build some tents and remain there with the glory of being in the Trinity. Because after all, that's what we were created for. Life with the Trinity in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Jesus tells them that they have to go, that it's not yet time for them to enter into the glory of the Trinity, that this was just a glimpse, a preview of, of Jesus's divine glory. Because there's still another mountain that he has to climb, and that will be the mountain of Calvary. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John down the mountain of the Trinity, the Mount of Transfiguration, and he continues to move forward toward Calvary. And he tells them not to tell anyone about this until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And it's all part of a massive rescue plan that had been in God's mind for all of eternity and had become necessary with the first sin of Adam and Eve, which we heard about last week. Now that rescue plan had, had begun to be carried out through Abraham, which we heard about in our first reading today. In our first reading, we heard, we heard that God tells Abraham three things. First, he promises him some land. Second, he pro promises him descendants. I will make of you a great nation, God tells Abraham. And by the way, Abraham at this point is 75 years old and he has no children. Now that will all change someday, but God makes one final promise and it's the most important one. That promise is that all communities and families in the world will be blessed through Abraham. Now this last promise will be carried out by Jesus Christ himself, who will be a descendant of Abraham. Now fast forward again to our story of the transfiguration, Jesus who has just revealed his divine nature. He's also preparing his disciples for what he is about to do for us in bringing about the blessings on all the communities and families of the world, not just the Jewish ones, but all of them. And he's preparing them for his passion and death, which he will accept on behalf of the world, which he most dearly loves and which the disciples will witness. And in the meantime, he tells the disciples as he tells us, do not be afraid. And then they walk with him down the mountain, completely unaware of the later events that will occur in Jerusalem and on Mount Calvary. It's a walk we take as well. And like the disciples, we continue to trust in Jesus, to be amazed at who he is. And we follow him as well, even though the path ahead might seem full of danger and disgrace. And as we work our way through Lent, we pray that we're able to listen to him more completely each day and that we can move forward without fear, trusting completely in him. And so a blessed second Sunday of Lent to you all.